Today, I'm very excited to be presenting to you the Marshallese population in Northwest Arkansas cultural competency training. Let's begin with the learning objectives. During this time, we want to talk about the background and history of the Marshallese in the United States and Northwest Arkansas. Our three main goals that focus on the Marshallese culture for this presentation are to understand what cultural humility is and become aware that cultural awareness is a lifelong learning process. Identify cultural characteristics of the Marshallese that may influence their health behaviors. Identify common Marshallese health beliefs and health risk factors. Use cross-cultural communication skills to address the health concerns of Marshallese patients. Our goal is that after this presentation, you will be able to understand your own cultural background and how it influences your practice, as well as learn about the Marshallese population in the United States and Northwest Arkansas in order to better recognize their approach to health. Cultural competency versus cultural humility. Cultural competency is solely focused on understanding the needs of the population group. Its end goal is cultural expertise. It does not incorporate self-awareness since the goal is to learn about the other person's culture. Cultural competence is about the provider being confident and comfortable when interacting with the patient. Cultural humility is the process of self-reflection and discovery to understand oneself and then others in order to build honest and trustworthy relationships. It is a lifelong process of where an individual starts by examining her or his own beliefs and cultural identity. As you self-reflect, it can be important to think through your own background and social environment and how it has shaped your experience. Explore your beliefs about race, ethnicity, class, religion, immigration status, gender roles, age. Where you live or grew up matters and shapes your views of others. All of these attributes and the value we give them are important to examine. Even people who genuinely believe in racial equality and justice unknowingly engage in behavior that may favor one group of people over another. When we self-reflect, we are able to recognize our biases. Bias, tendency to believe that some people, ideas, etc., are better than others, and this often results in unfair treatment of others. Biases can create stereotypes, which is the process of categorizing people on superficial criteria such as age, clothes, gender, wealth, skin color, and disability. Implicit bias, it can be activated quickly and unknowingly by a situation. For example, you hear someone's accent and assume you know where they are coming from and why they are here. This can happen without a person's intent or awareness. It is important to recognize our biases because these can influence our interactions with patients, which can affect treatment recommendations. This can then contribute to a lack of trust and commitment from the patient, which can lead to poor adherence. These questions could be asked before you start a conversation with a family or individual. Ask yourself, do I see this person as part of a group or category? Example, first time mother, teen mother, being from a particular or racial ethnic group, low income family, or no English or limited English proficiency. If yes, will that view lead to assumptions about how long the conversation may take? Longer because they will not understand what I am saying, not worth spending a lot of time, because they will not understand or implement recommendations. Influence how I communicate with person or family. Give only basic recommendations. Work with interpreter instead of family or person. Hinder my ability to feel and express empathy toward person or family. Feelings about how working with similar families have gone in the past. Affect the types of information I offer. Omit some recommendations because people from this population don't usually accept or like them. Affect my expectations about whether the family can succeed in carrying out plan to breastfeed their infant. 
people from this group never follow through. After each conversation, check in with yourself again. Did you have any assumptions? How did they affect how you interacted? This information can be used to check yourself on how bias might affect your conversations with families. Let's start with some history and background on our Marshallese. Significant population growth. Marshallese population in the United States has tripled between 2000 and 2010 the second fastest growing population in the United States. The fastest growth occurred in the South. Arkansas has the largest population of Marshallese living in the United States. Approximately there are 11,000 Marshallese living in Northwest Arkansas, concentrated primarily in Springdale. Marshallese also live in some West Coast states, including California, Oregon, and Washington, as well as Hawaii. Aside from the Marshallese, there are other Pacific Islander groups in Northwest Arkansas, Native Hawaiian, Micronesian, Polynesian, Tongan, and Fijian. This map gives an indication of where the Marshall Islands are in respect to other countries. They are between Hawaii and Guam. To get to the Marshall Islands from Northwest Arkansas means that you would travel to Hawaii and take a plane for another five hours. The Marshall Islands is a group of islands that cover a large area of ocean, approximately 750,000 square miles, about the size of Texas, and only approximately 70 square miles of total land area, about the size of Northwest Arkansas. Population, there are 29 habitable atolls in five islands, Walking or boating are dominant forms of transportation in the outer islands, but about 70% of the population live on Evi, Kwajalein, and Majuro, the capital of the Marshall Islands. The modern bikini swimsuit was named after Bikini Atoll. It was first introduced four days after the first atomic bomb was dropped on Bikini Atoll. Between 1946 and 1958, the United States carried out multiple nuclear tests on multiple islands in the Marshall Islands, totaling an equivalent to 7,200 Hiroshima-sized bombs. So imagine a Hiroshima-sized bomb being dropped every day for 12 years. On March 1, 1954, Bravo, a 15 megaton bomb, the largest thermo nuclear device detonated by the United States was dropped on Bikini Atoll. Needless to say, the Marshallese were exposed to enormous amounts of radiation and their fishing and food sources were destroyed. In 1986, the United States signed the Compact of Free Association, or COFA, with three Pacific Island states. Republic of the Marshall Islands, Republic of Palau, Federate States of Micronesia. What is COFA? Basically, COFA allowed members of the freely associated states to live, work, and study in the United States permanently without a visa or green card. COFA migrants travel to and from the United States without a passport. COFA gave the United States greater control and exclusive access to over a million square miles of the Pacific. Allowed the United States to conduct military activity in the Marshall Islands while conducting missile interceptor tests and space operations support. Prior to the health care reform of 1996, COFA migrants were eligible for federally funded benefit programs such as Medicaid, Medicare, and the Children's Health Insurance Program, CHIP. After the health care reform, COFA migrants were no longer considered qualified immigrants, even though they pay local, state, and federal taxes. While other resident aliens have a five-year waiting period, COFA migrants were completely removed from Medicaid benefits. Only United States citizens qualify for SNAP but Marshallese-born children do not. 24% of Marshallese in the United States are uninsured and are not eligible for Medicare or Medicaid. 
According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, in the United States, the leading causes of death for Asian Americans or Pacific Islanders include cancer, heart disease, stroke, unintentional injuries, diabetes, Alzheimer's. This is similar to the leading causes of death in the United States overall, with the exception of unintentional injuries. So we know that the Marshallese have significant health issues. Let's talk about some of the factors that influence health behaviors among the Marshallese, such as family, health beliefs, religion, diet, exercise, and languages. What is culture? Learned behaviors pass from one generation to the next. Culture influences beliefs about health, disease, treatment, and health care providers. Conscious and unconscious values, ideas, attitudes, and symbols. Physical is clothing and tools, non-physical attitudes, beliefs, and values. Understanding social, structural, psychological, and cultural factors can make a big difference in health outcomes because cultural issues play a major role in patient compliance. There are common things we associate with culture, food, language, music, but there are many underlying things such as body language, attitudes towards age, perception of self, importance of time, that are also part of culture and play a role in how people interact. Just like the North and South of the United States has different cultures and each state has unique subcultures there are many different aspects to the Marshallese culture. Family first, everything else comes second, work, school, appointments, etc. Extended families, multiple generations living under one roof. Parenting is a shared responsibility. Extended family are involved. Sisters, brothers, and cousins consider mothers and fathers to children. Older adults act as decision makers for the whole family, not just the home. Needs of family or clan more important than needs of individual. Gender roles. In most cases, males are expected to provide for his family financially, though in the United States, both parents tend to work. Wife normally handles the money. The husband tends to have significant influence in decision making. Matrilineal in the islands, land rights are handed down through women. Decisions that affect the house and children are made by oldest women in the home. Due to the shift to a modern economy, changes in tradition and family roles have become necessary. In the States, both husband and wife have to work and provide for the bills. Roles are the same, but women work and take care of the house. Roles of elders. Elders have prestigious status in Marshallese families. Family members look to elders for advice. Age indicates knowledge and experience, and older adults are respected for their knowledge. Marshallese elders are not sent to nursing or retirement homes. To do so is dishonorable and shameful. Roles of youth. Adults and teens expected to contribute to have responsibilities and chores while seniors are expected to stay home and mostly take care of children. Parents are authority figures to be obeyed and respected. Younger generations care for their old. Most people are buried and very few are cremated. Organ donation. There is no such thing as organ donation in the Republic of the Marshall Islands. It is never mentioned there. It is important to ask questions and keep that option open, have that conversation. Depends on the situation and age group. If you want to talk about this, look for the spokesperson for the family. Might be a brother or oldest daughter or son. Give family time to decide and prepare. Ask in the earlier parts, not right when they die. Churches play a pivotal role in life. There are numerous social and economic benefits that come with being part of a church community. Pastors are involved when family asks for support and prayer. Nearly 95% of Marshallese are Christians, and there are a variety of religious groups. Churches can bring people up in the community through community connections or networks. 
church networks show great promise as an avenue to reach large numbers of individuals and organize supportive action and provide resources and support. Health practices. Beliefs for causes of illness can be sin, curse or witchcraft, stress, unhealthy lifestyle, nuclear testing. Education is important. Patient might believe that a rash is caused by a spell, so explain to them that medicine shows that diabetes can cause rashes. Acculturated immigrants are more accepting of Western medicine. Healers, most Marshallese will try self-medicating or herbal traditional remedies before seeking professional medical care. Some remedies that Marshallese will seek first are use of herbal remedies. When using traditional healers, Marshallese may be put on special diets, bathing restrictions, and sexual activity restrictions. May get prescription medications sent in from relatives in the Marshall Islands or use other family members' prescriptions. Mental illness is usually seen as a result of a curse or spell by other Marshallese. Like a purposeful curse cast after a disagreement, not as associated with stigma as in American culture. Use PHQ-2 for evaluation. This is an acceptable avenue of evaluation. Body image, heavier, curvier body type used to be viewed as healthy. Advising patient to lose weight might not be followed because it would create negative body image and be viewed as an insult, you may not want to start with this. Married person, usually female, who wasn't curvy was believed to be in an unhealthy marriage. Husband and his family are not taking good care of her. This view is still strong in the outer islands. A Marshallese man cannot be slim. He may be viewed as sick and too weak to do heavy work around the home and take care of his wife and family. Prior to the nuclear testing from the 40s and 50s, the Marshallese traditional diet consisted mainly of fish and seafood, fruits and vegetables, coconut, breadfruit, taros, bandanas, and leafy greens. After testing, most food sources were contaminated and were replaced with rice, white bread, potatoes, ramen, canned meats, spam, tuna, corned beef, sugar and sweets, common beverages, soda, Kool-Aid, canned vegetables, corn and green beans. Family eats from one pot. A Marshallese family prepares meals for the whole family. Even though an extended family lives under one roof, the meal is made for the whole family. This makes it challenging for someone with diabetes to change their diet. This is why education is important. Consider talking with a person who is in charge of preparing meals so the whole family can benefit from eating healthier meals. Break down carbs and proteins. Consider terminology when thinking about education and food. When the meal is prepared at home or in Caymans, adults tend to have more variety in their diet. This is only because we know that children will not eat their vegetables. We don't want food to go to waste. If we know kids won't eat it, we won't make it an option. And most Marshallese won't fight with kids over eating more variety, like fruits and vegetables. When recommending exercise or increasing physical activity, consider whether a patient is a new immigrant, a cultured Marshallese, or U.S. born. Most Marshallese need incentives for exercise, won't exercise just to exercise. Marshallese May Day is a time when you will see several Marshallese at the parks practicing and trying to get in shape. They may think they have too much work at home or on the job to make time to exercise. Busy schedules and work at home keeps them active enough. Encourage patients to incorporate exercise into their daily routine. Before World War II, in the islands, grandparents walked from one end of the island to the other. Daily chores were manpowered. Now we sit down even when we cook. Don't talk about losing weight, but rather frame it as being active. Ways to incorporate into daily routine. Walk around the grocery store. Park far away to add to some walking. Marshallese older adults are less likely to be active. 
exercise is not viewed as dignified. Elders have earned the right to do less. Younger family members often are charged with chores. Considerations for providers and staff. Culturally appropriate interpreting. It is important that the interpreter doesn't just repeat what is being said, but that they use cultural appropriate words. Now that we've talked about some of the factors that can impact the health of the Marshallese, I want to take a moment to talk about one option to help bridge the gap between underserved communities and the healthcare system. Community health workers, otherwise known as lay educators, peer educators, patient advocator, and many other definitions have been shown to be effective in chronic disease prevention and treatment, maternal and child health, infectious disease prevention and management programs. Community health workers are part of the community they serve and are able to deliver culturally appropriate messages and instruction and act as a source of cultural knowledge for providers. Determine whether the patient speaks enough English to comprehend. Don't make assumptions that patient or family members do or don't speak English. Provide written materials in Marshallese or English. This is ideal because even if they aren't proficient in English, they may have someone at home who can read it for them. Use plain English. We know that the use of family members as interpreters is not ideal, but sometimes necessary. Because of family roles, healthcare professionals may find themselves in a group of family members when sharing medical information. Consider who is in the room before sharing information. It is very inappropriate to discuss women's health issues when male relatives are present and vice versa. Consult with patient in private about who is approved family member to speak with regarding care and whether patient is comfortable using interpreter provided by clinic or hospital. Sometimes interpreters may be related to the patient or there may be family issues between the interpreter and patient that may prevent both from cooperating. There are legal requirements to provide language services if patient cannot speak or comprehend English. Prior to conversation with patient, explain to the interpreter what information you are trying to convey and obtain. Pause often. Speak at an even pace and allow interpreter time to interpret. Remember that it takes longer to translate if interpreter is interrupted. Ask the interpreter about any potential cultural misunderstandings. Ask one question at a time. Ask the interpreter's opinion of whether or not the patient seems to understand the relayed information or if there may be any cultural misunderstandings. Respect interpreter's judgment. Let's listen to this community health worker. Hi, my name is Terry Takamaru. I've been a community health worker for uh, UMS for since 2014. Until now, uh, I started out as a contractor in 2014, began my full staff in 2017. A community health worker is a member of the community that is there to help bridge the gap between the health providers and their patients uh, with medical terminology and anything that is needed uh, regarding their health. Interpreting is part of the services that the community health worker provided. It is one of the many services that they provided, but they provided more than that. They help with uh, navigate the health system for the patients, also help them with local resources, as well as helping the health providers um, understand their patients.
The reason why it is very important to have a community health worker in your team member is because they're there to help you with any barriers you have um, regarding to your patients. Uh, for instance, uh, you might get mad at a patient that they're not complying with their medications, but there are most of the time there's a lot of roles that play into that that they're not able to be complying with their medications. One of them maybe because uh, they have no control over it. They live with family members who might have had a car or vehicle that is broken down or they're at work and they have to weigh in do they have to miss a day of work or go pick up the medication. So there's a lot of factors that play into that. And so that is the reason why you have to have a a uh, community health worker to help you and get that information so that way y you understand that it is not the patient is not trying to comply but there's a lot of barriers they're facing themselves okay. and also um, sometimes I notice that a doctor will come with their medical terminology uh, or their medical mindset and for me to interpret that to a patient that has a fifth grade um, education, I have to take that from that mindset to this mindset. And that is, and it, 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 there's a lot of things that plays into that. You have to think about the culture, you have to think about their level, education level. And so that is the reason why it is very important to have a community health worker. It's because to bridge that gap, whatever barriers there is, they're there to bridge that gap for you. I wish, I really wish all the clinics, um, hospitals, healthcare facilities, uh, hire their own community health worker because that is, the, that is the key to provide the appropriate and the proper care you need for your patients. So yesterday, there was a, a really good example of um, a story of being a community health worker. Um, we had, the doctor was asking the patient, uh, can you tell me the name of the medication? And the patient is like, okay, hold on, because I have to look through, through my purse to get it. And the thing is that the, she doesn't know the name, and most of the patients, they don't know the name. They just know that it is for blood pressure or it is for diabetes, but they don't know how to, and because they don't know how to pronounce the name, and, but they know what is it for. And sometimes they don't know what's the medication for. They just know that they're supposed to take it this way. Anyway, go back to the story. <laughs> so the story is this, that the, she was looking for the medications and to get the name of it. And the doctor's like, okay, go ahead and just spell it out. And she's like, looking for somebody, because this was over the phone, because we're having appointment on the phone. Uh, she's looking for somebody to get the name to us. Because I guess she, she could not um, read the, I kind of like felt that she didn't, she didn't know which is the name of the pill on the label. And she was just looking for somebody in her house because she's asking. And I, from that, I kind of get the feeling that that was happening. And so I was telling the doctor, I'm like, I think she doesn't know this. Can we ask her to take a picture of it and text it to my working cell phone? And that's what they did. So if I wasn't being there to tell the doctor, this would have been like something that gone out of context where the doctor is frustrated and the patient is frustrated at the same time. And there's a lot of time that this happens. And you know, that is, the, I, I have to like stop and say, okay, I know why it's not going the way you're expecting it, because this is what it is happening right now. It is important that they are welcomed when they walk in the clinic even when they come into the general area. 
helps them know where they belong. Greet people in Marshallese. Make eye contact and give them a handshake. The doctor should not ask, why are you here? Or what are you here for? Because it makes people feel unwelcomed. It is offensive. It is important for the doctor to know the patient's background and show that to the patient. Rephrase it as, I see you have diabetes. How can I help you? Straightforward questions are offensive because of the language barrier. Small talk builds rapport early on will make a big difference in communication. Family members, because of the familiar roles, it is common that multiple family members will be consulted when making medical decisions. The patient should be asked whether or not this is acceptable. If family must be asked to leave room, make sure it is explained as to why. Be aware of gender differences. How comfortable is the patient with male or female doctor? Physical space. Most do not welcome physical contact, hugs, touching hair, patting back, etc., but will do so for an exam. Don't touch the patient's body without consent, especially if they are of the opposite sex. Consider scheduling more time. One study from UAMS Northwest found healthcare providers have challenges with the Marshallese community concept of time called island time. Speak in first person directly to the patient, especially when using an interpreter. Speak directly to the person, not to the interpreter. Pay attention to patient's body language. It can tell you a lot. Nodding may be nothing more than a polite gesture. Does not imply understanding. Marshallese may nod as a sign that they are listening to what you are saying, but not necessarily because they understand. May be embarrassed to let on that they don't understand and may not want to bother the provider with petty questions. If patient is laughing, it is not because the patient thinks it's funny. The patient might be nervous. Don't ask why the patient is laughing while he or she is there. Take interpreter, community health worker outside the room and ask them. Yes, maybe, mean, yes, no, or maybe. Yes has more than one meaning due to the necessity of cooperating with an authority and the discomfort of refusing others' requests. Ask follow-up questions and wait patiently. Culture affects how direct, open, formal communication is. Notice tone, volume, posture, facial expressions. If you see a reaction, eyebrows moving, keep that in mind. Explain technical terms. Don't use double negatives. This is confusing in English and even more so in translation. Let's listen to this patient. Yale, my name is Morda Netwan. I've been living in the United States for 24 years now. It's about insurance. Um, you don't have to have medical, dental, or vision insurance in the Marshall Island, and you don't need them not like you're in the state. Um, all you have to do is pay $5 and then you can be seen. That $5 will cover your visit along with your medication if you're prescribed medication. So it's not like you're in the state and you can see a reason why quite a few Marshallese don't understand how to insu use insurance or we don't have insurance because we don't understand all of that copay and deductible and all of that. I will bring up the time that I have my youngest child. I have three older than the younger, um, my youngest. And with the older three, I never had any luck with breastfeeding. So I remember when I used to go to my prenatal visit, I will be asked by my doctor and nurses, what are my plan after I have my child? So I told them that I would like to try um, both bottle and press. So I remember after I had my baby, um, 
I think they make sure that they send in a nurse, um, a coaching nursing person, so that person could actually sit down with me and show me how to do it instead of just tell me, well, this is how you do it. The person actually spent like 30 minutes each time just to really show me how to do it. So I was able to do both things for one year. So I really appreciate that. I don't like it when they send in their student without notifying or at least give me, as a courtesy, tell me that, well, we're going to bring in these students. And that has happened to me several times. Um, I feel like I'm being experiment. I feel like I am a guinea pig. With, with all that testing that has been happening in the Marshall Island, I feel like quite of us feel that same way. So I don't appreciate when they just bring in students without even letting you know. I would like them to know that we're really, um, we are reserving private people. We wouldn't just come in and just open up and say what we're in there for. So um, I think they need to understand where we're coming from. It's not like we're not cooperating with these doctors and nurses, but we would like to have small talks and then we'll be able to open up and really communicate well with the doctor. Just, just how is your day? Or one thing that I noticed that works in the clinic, all these students are learning like very basic work, like Yahweh, that could open up a channel of communication. You feel you're welcome. If I'm in an appointment and I have maybe a family member or a male relatives right there, I wouldn't want them to ask me personal information like health, health, um, something that is related to my health, it, especially when it's a, there's a male person there. Um, I would rather that they ask me first if it's okay to discuss my woman's health in front of these uh, male, other people next, I mean, right there in the room because it's culturally, culturally inappropriate. The same thing with uh, a male, if it's a male patient. Maybe ask them first, do, do these people need to be here before we discuss your health? Or do I need to pull them out? If, if they see me bringing several people, there's a reason why I'm bringing those people because I need, I mean, support. So if allowable, maybe let me take one person back into the exam room. Sometimes we need them. There are people that bring in family member for um, so they can interpret for the patient. And sometimes it just to. Um, I think we like to come in groups for support, especially if we're not back on the island. We feel kind of uncomfortable, especially if it's a new clinic or a hospital that we're going into, not knowing if you're going to have an interpreter, or just to bring that person in for support. I can say it's a plus. If they can hire interpreter and CHW, because those GHW community health worker, um, they understand the culture. So they can, to the side, talk to the doctor and say, hey, this is so and so. They're not, um, there might be some uh, misunderstanding, like why are they not coming into their appointment? Why are they canceling? Why did they wait up until this moment? There might be other reason why. So those CHW understand those understand those kind of things. Meditation instructions. Give verbal and written instructions on the important points. Translate instructions for patient to take home. Explain why they need the medication. Consider timing issues due to work shifts. When you get up, when you go to bed, rather than in the morning, in the evening, before breakfast or dinner. Repeat important points. Have patient or family repeat back instructions. Remember, nodding does not imply understanding. Ask about herbal and prescription medications. 
If a patient is very sick, it is likely that he or she has already consulted with an elder and tried a traditional remedy. Ask open-ended questions. What other medicines or herbs are you using? Or what else have you tried to make the problem better? Barriers to taking the medication. Educate on side effects and give a time frame. You might not feel the best in the beginning, but it's important to keep taking the medicine. Ask, what might keep you from taking this medication? Or what kept you from taking this medicine as prescribed? What complications did you have with this medicine? Consider refill issues. Explain the need to continue taking meds even if the patient is feeling better. Explain how long to continue taking meds, like saying, until it is gone. Every day for the next three months, then return for visit. If an interpreter is available, have instructions written out in simple martial leads. Give out a medication card. This card can be used if they ever need to talk about medication. They can carry the card at all times. Write down usage, doctor, etc. Preventive care. This is often a familiar concept. Problem visits are an excellent time to discuss wellness visits. Explain that it is unrelated to the problem visit. Relate to cooking, preparing food, adding the right ingredients, taking care of cooking equipment. The Marshallese population is increasing and have a high burden of chronic illness. Time and patience are key. This is true for any patient interaction, but more so for the Marshallese. They may not tell you what they need immediately, depending on their comfort level. It may take many visits before a patient is comfortable enough to tell you what they are really in for. The Marshallese are a private and reserved people. They are more comfortable in settings with other Marshallese. If you do not have Marshallese staff, consider contracting out part-time interpreters. An option for contract workers, not just an interpreter, but an educator, facilitator, advocate, etc. Work on gaining trust. How? If you do not show interest, neither will they. Ask about their day. Have small talk. Marshallese live in an immediate world, so we tend to expect immediate results. Educate patient that it might take time to see improvements. Usually, there is more compliance seen when treated as walk-ins or same-day appointments. You need to be willing and open to learn and respect different cultures and a different way of doing things. It is important to consider that other cultures may do things differently, and this is not inherently right or wrong, just different. You need to be open to learning what these differences are and why people do things differently. Build relationships, get to know your patients, ask where they are from, and research more about their culture. Understanding the client's culture and language can improve your ability to make accurate assessments. There is always more to learn. It's a process, not a one-time event. Thank you for joining us today for the Marshallese Population in Northwest Arkansas Cultural Competency Training.